So open your Bibles to 2 John, please. I want to read the following. John writes, 2 John 9, anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. The most important uh, discussion that we can ever have uh, with someone is the discussion dealing with the issue of salvation. How are you saved? What must you do to be saved? How are you to believe if you are saved? It's a conversation you can have with anyone because it relates to everyone. Everyone has a soul. Everyone has an opportunity to be saved. Salvation is offered to everyone in the world. And so having that discussion with anyone else is the most important discussion that you can have. Now in our society, there are a lot of different religious groups that are promoting their various beliefs and even within Christianity, not all say the same thing when it comes to salvation. Now we can't speak for other religions, but as far as Christianity goes, we have a clear and sure guide in our understanding of this subject. And that clear and sure guide is Jesus Christ Himself. It begins with Him and it ends with Him. Unfortunately, not everyone says the same thing about salvation. And so in order to clarify this issue in our own minds so that we can speak with one voice, one teaching, let us consider what Jesus Himself teaches about salvation using only His words spoken on the subject. Because a lot of times the discussion about salvation, and especially when it becomes a debate with someone, people go to Romans, and then they go to 1 Corinthians, and they go over here, and they, they jump all over the place, you know, which is fine, it's all inspired, it's all the Bible. But I thought, why not just narrow down what Jesus Himself said, just that, to see what exactly does the Lord Himself, who is the source of salvation, what does the Lord say about this? I believe that in this way we can lay aside what's traditional, what's popular, what's comfortable, and focus only on what Jesus actually said about how someone is saved. Hopefully there'll be no argument after that. And so Jesus, in order to be saved, Jesus said that one must come to Him for salvation. John chapter 10, verse nine. He said, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. Pretty clear, isn't it? He will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. So the first thing that we see here <laughs> is Jesus Himself speaking. And the first thing that one must do is come to Christ Himself for His salvation. No other person or thing can accomplish it. A scripture that refers to this, what Jesus says, is Peter. And Peter says, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. And so what is Peter doing? He's simply confirming what Jesus Himself said. This is so because no one else in history has done for man in regards to salvation what Christ has done. You know, a lot of people have lived good lives. A lot of men and women have changed the course of their nations. Many have started religions, written wise words, but no one has dealt with the sin of the world through an atoning and purifying death and no one has ever been resurrected from the dead as a verification that what he taught and did and promised was valid. <laughs> what better proof can you have that what Jesus said was true than his resurrection? I mean, if you can resurrect somebody from the dead, you can do anything else. If you can resurrect somebody from the dead, that means you can resurrect me from the dead. So I'm, you know, I'm ready to believe you. 
In Matthew 10 verse 32, Jesus said that we must confess His name. And the point He's making is that in order to be saved, we must acknowledge first and foremost that only He can save us. Because if we got other saviors, well, He'd be just one of many. But He said, no, no, if you want to be saved, you have to come through me. Jesus also said that faith is necessary in order to be saved. Luke chapter eight. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those beside the road are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they will not believe and be saved. So faith is necessary for salvation. Says who? Well, says Jesus. Once we've recognized that salvation is in Christ, it is found only in Him, then we must believe that what He says is true. Not just the intellectual assent that His sayings and His promises and work are valid and truthful, but a faith that uses His word as a basis for one's conduct and guarantee for personal salvation from death and condemnation. It's not just that I believe that Jesus was a good man or a good prophet, even that Jesus you know, performed miracles and so on and so forth. No, no, what I believe is that He accomplished my salvation. That only He, that's what I, the substance of what I believe. That's very important. A lot of people in the world believe Jesus is, was a good man, even a prophet. Muslims believe that. But the substance of the faith that they have about Jesus has no power to save them. It's not just who we believe, but what do we believe about Him? And Jesus said, you, you need to believe that I'm the one that saves you. That's very important. Jesus pays us, human beings, the ultimate respect as human beings by allowing us to express our free will in regards to salvation by making faith one of the conditions. You need free will in order to believe. You know, robots don't have free will. Well, robots don't believe. Dogs don't have free will. Well, yeah, dogs can't be saved either. Neither can cats or whatever. But human beings have free will. And if they have free will, it means they have the possibility of being saved. God the Father planned our salvation. God the Holy Spirit prepared the way for our salvation and God the Son accomplished it on the cross, but divinity leaves room for our faith in order to complete it. It isn't much to say yes to the eternal God, but without that yes, the plan, the preparation, and the redemptive work of Christ is all for naught. Because in order to be saved, Jesus says that we first must believe. We need to say yes to God. We need to say yes to Jesus. I do believe, yes. Jesus also said that repentance was necessary for salvation. Luke chapter nine, when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. When they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, he has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, behold, Lord, half my possessions I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. Listen to what Jesus said. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now here the story doesn't mention the word repentance, but it describes the attitude of sincere repentance. Repentance is not just sorrow for the past. A lot of people are sorry for their past. A lot of people grieve over their past. Silly things they've done, bad things they've done, shameful things they've done. A lot of people like that. They're, they're, the, the, the psychiatrist's office are filled with people who have regret for their, for their past, but that's not, 
That's not repentance. Repentance is not just sorrow for past sins, but a change of attitude about sin in general. In repentance, we go from being lovers of self, lovers of sin, and the things of this world, to becoming lovers of God, lovers of righteousness, and lovers of heaven and the promises that God will give us. Lovers of righteousness and lovers of those who are lost in this world. That's what repentance is. Jesus sums up the attitude in Mark chapter eight when he says, and he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. There's salvation he's talking about. Repentance isn't negotiating or bargaining with God about how much sin that you can keep in your life and still be saved. I've had Bible studies with people who've actually kind of you know, begin horse trading with me about, <laughs> you know, well, how, well how about if I don't give this up right away, can I still be baptized tonight? You know, that's, that's the wrong attitude. Wrong attitude. Repentance is the is the process where there's a total transformation of the direction and attitude and function of ourselves as believers. Although it is painful, repentance is the joyful experience of seeing our old life slip away as we desire more and more to know and do and be only what Christ wants us to know and, and be and, and become. You know, a person can talk about Jesus and his faith, but unless his actions in big and little things demonstrate a real change, what is claimed as faith is nothing more than false piety. I mean, Jesus, what did he say? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Jesus said this. I know that Peter said it too, you know, Acts 2. Repent, you know, let each of you be baptized. Peter said it, but Jesus said it first. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Someone says, well, we're not sure if we need to repent or not. Well, just take a look at what Jesus is saying. He says, absolutely, you need to repent. Jesus also said, you need to be baptized in order to be saved. Simple verse, Mark 16, 16, he who has believed there's the thing that he mentioned before, and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. So the first step in denying self is to bury self in the waters of baptism. Baptism is, is necessary in order to be saved for many, many reasons. It's necessary in order to be saved because at baptism our sins are forgiven. Acts 2 verse 38. At baptism we receive the Holy Spirit. Acts 2 verse 38. At baptism we're added to the church. Acts 2 47. At baptism we put on Christ. Galatians 3 26. At baptism we are saved, literally saved. First to Peter 3 21. You know I get lots of mail and lots of comments uh, uh, on, the, on the Bible Talk uh, website, you know, stuff coming in all the time. And there's still people out there, they say, where does it, <laughs> it's like playing t-ball sometimes, you know? Somebody will say, where does it say in the Bible that you need, you need to be baptized? Where does it say in the Bible that, that baptism is part of the process of salvation? And I want to answer, I don't, I want to be polite, but I want to answer, are you kidding me? I don't even know where to start to answer this question. There are so many references to this particular uh, thing in the, in the New Testament. Simple logic dictates that in order to be saved, one must be forgiven, right? Because who are the saved? Well, they're the forgiven. Logic dictates that those who have the Holy Spirit, well, they must be the saved because certainly the unsaved don't have the Holy Spirit. You get the point? The unsaved are not members of the church. The unsaved are not in Christ. The unsaved don't put on Christ. The unsaved don't have a clear conscience before God. And if all these things are connected to baptism, as the Bible teaches, 
then baptism is therefore necessary for salvation because without it, these things do not occur. And without these things, you cannot be saved. The foremost reason why baptism is necessary for salvation is because Jesus commands it. And He commands it in connection with personal salvation. He doesn't say it's an outward sign. You know, these people say, well, that's just an outward sign of something that has taken place in the past. And I always ask them, okay, where does it say that in the New Testament? I know where it says that in, you know, in, your, in your Bible study booklet at your particular church. All I want you to do is show me where it says that in the New Testament. Just show it to me. You know, no, no one ever shows it to me. Why? Because it's not there. Some people say, well, it's just a ceremony. And you, know, you can do it or not, it doesn't make any difference, really. Then why does Jesus command it? <laughs> I mean, simple grammar. Mark 16, 16, that's an imperative sentence. If you school teachers and those of you who remember some of your grammar there, what's an imperative sentence? You must do this. Please sit down and be quiet. What is that? That's, an that's a command. Sit, the teacher said, comma, please sit down and be quiet. That's a command, imperative sentence. Repent and be baptized. That's an imperative sentence, a command. So Jesus himself doesn't say it's an outward sign or it's just a ceremony or it's unimportant, it's an unimportant ritual. Jesus connects baptism with salvation, not us. Some people say, oh, that's a Church of Christ doctrine. Really? <laughs> Seems to me they were teaching it back in the first century. Yes, we are saved by faith, of course we are. But that faith must be expressed by our will. And Jesus says that this expression of our will, of our faith, is accomplished by repentance and baptism. Jesus is the one who draws this line, not the church. It's not Church of Christ theologians that have figured out that there is a connection between baptism and salvation. It's the New Testament that very clearly and openly shows us that time after time after time. Jesus also said that in order to be saved, you must endure to the end, faithful to the end. Again, I read Matthew 10, brother will betray, here he's speaking to his uh, apostles. He says, brother will betray brother to death and a father his child and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death and you will be hated by all because of my name. But it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. That's Jesus talking there. It's the one that endures to the end who will be saved. In this passage, Jesus is teaching His disciples about two cataclysmic events in the context of this passage. One, the destruction of Jerusalem, which would happen in their lifetimes. And the second, His coming, which would happen at any time, but would happen at the end of the world. The message for both events was similar, however. Only those who were faithful to the end would be saved. In these passages, he tried to prepare them by telling them some of the things they may have to suffer and endure. He said, if you're my disciples, you, you may endure family division or persecution and violence and suffering. You may have to put up with false teachers and hypocrites in the church, social and environmental unrest, unfaithfulness and lack of love by many in the church. You will have to suffer many, if not all of these things, he said. And then he finishes by saying, what? Despite all of these things that you may suffer, some or all of these things, only the ones who endure until the end will be saved. It's amazing to me when I see people who abandon the church and they abandon the church because somebody forgot to put their name in the bulletin on their birthday. 
or someone offended them in some, and it could be some very real way, some brother or sister said something which was unkind or did something that was really not nice, you know, just offensive and hurtful, and for, because of that, it was, oh, I'm done, I'm out of here. Really, really, this is your excuse. This is what you're going to bring to the Lord on judgment day. Well, you know, I, my birthday's important to me. <laughs> really? You haven't read this passage here where Jesus said you, you, you might be tortured, offended, killed, raped, you know, they may burn down your house, they, they can do all these things. And through all of this, if you remain faithful to the end, you'll be saved. Tell me again now your reason for having abandoned the church, for having abandoned the faith. Tell me once again why you quit. His point to them and to us is that these things are not to be used as valid excuses for falling away, as many do, thinking that God will ignore their unfaithfulness because they had a good excuse. Brothers and sisters, these things have always been and always will be obstacles to us that we must overcome in order to reach the end. You see, in the Christian race, only those who finish faithfully are saved. You don't have to be running fast. You don't have to be a Christian superstar. You don't have to get everything absolutely right, never make any mistakes. But you do have to finish. Bloodied and bowed and broken and scarred and hurt and tired and fed up and offended. That's okay, but we need to finish. I include myself in this group. So why this sermon? I believe that most of us heard the things that I've just said here today, probably many times. But I wanted to make sure of three things. Number one, that everyone is absolutely convinced about what Jesus himself says concerning salvation for their own souls and for the souls of others that they may speak to. Be absolutely sure of the things that I've said, not because Mike Mazzalongo has spoken them, but because Mike Mazzalongo has pointed you to the New Testament where Jesus has said these things. Number two, to make sure that this congregation and all others who visit with us know what our basic teaching is on this basic question so there be no misunderstanding of our doctrine. What do we teach here at the Choctaw Church of Christ? This is what we teach in the Choctaw Church of Christ. And then thirdly, as a way of challenging those here tonight to examine themselves and see if they have been saved, and if not, do something about it. This morning, many of you left, well, almost everyone was gone. When uh, Linda Ziegler, our sister in the Lord, a wife of uh, Dan Ziegler, uh, who had been talking to myself and Marty for a little while about this topic, decided to be baptized. She had examined her faith and her life. Yes, yeah, she did believe in Jesus and he was the son of God, but she looked back on her time and said, you know, I remember clearly when I was baptized, it was just because uh, you know, my mother-in-law said, you, you ought to do that if you want to fit in. <laughs> she wanted to fit in, so she did that. And as she heard the gospel over and over again, preached by many different people, it dawned on her that, you know what? I, I in no way was thinking of my sins being forgiven or receiving the Holy Spirit or obeying. None of those ideas were in my mind when I was baptized. And she understood, if you doubt, then remove the doubt. Be baptized in the right way for the right biblical reason. And there are many biblical reasons to be baptized. 
to obey Christ, to wash away sin, to receive the gift of the, her, uh, the Spirit, to put on Christ. To, you know, the, the Bible explains salvation in a variety of ways. Any one of those ways is fine. If you're baptized in order to obey Christ, but you don't quite understand yet that at baptism you will receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, it's okay. Because if you're baptized for a correct biblical reason, one of them, then you receive all of the gifts at baptism. That was my experience. I read Mark 16, 16 as a young man. I said, you know, I didn't do that. I did not obey Christ in the way that the Bible says that I should. And so I was baptized. I was immersed the correct way for a a correct Bible reason to obey Jesus in this matter, Mark 16, 16. And then months later, I was reading in Acts and I noticed, wait a minute, it says here that when you're baptized, you receive the Holy Spirit. And I went to the one who had taught me and said, do I need to be rebaptized you know, to get the Spirit? And he said, well, no, because you're going to be baptized a lot of times in your life. Because <laughs> a lot of things happen at baptism. And that's good for you. You're discovering all the wonderful things that God gives to the one that obeys Him in this thing. And as you discover them, you realize you received all of those gifts. But if you were baptized because it was your birthday, okay, that's not a biblical reason. You know, the, 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 I tell people, just be safe in your mind and your conscience and in your heart. Be immersed because immersion is the way to be baptized and do it for a reason that's in the New Testament. You'll be good to, good to go. Belief in Christ and confession of His name if you haven't done it. Repentance of your sins if you haven't done it. Be immersed if you weren't immersed and be faithful or return to being faithful if you were not. And finally add just one last reason for this here before we close and that's encouragement. Encouragement. This lesson is to encourage anyone here tonight to ask for prayer, certainly if they need the help of the church, to identify, of course, with this congregation as one member did this morning, and to extend the hand of fellowship to anyone who wishes to do so. If you have any of these needs, or if you think you may have the need to be baptized, then you, know, you don't have to make a big dramatic thing and, Speak to any one of the elders, speak to anyone here. Speak to myself or Marty or Mike and we'll be happy to sit down, listen, share, study with you, look at the important passages that deal specifically with what you're thinking about to make sure that your salvation is secure. And I, you know, Marty was talking about having security, feeling sure about our salvation. Great lesson this morning, great sermon. And tonight I'm giving you the building blocks to make sure that you feel that security. Every time that I felt insecure about my salvation, am I really saved? Oh boy, I messed up and this and that. Or somebody smarter, way smarter than me came along and you know, kind of broke down some of my arguments. I had to think back, you know, am I really saved? And then I would think back to November 1977 and say, wait a minute, I, I remember in November 77, I confess that I did believe that Jesus was the Son of God. And then Jim Metter, that was his name, immersed me in the water. And I came up, so yes, I'm still good to go. I'll never have to do that ever again. So if you have any needs in those areas, we encourage you to come forward now as Brother John leads us in our song of encouragement. Shall we stand, please? <laughs>